Harbor Church. Oh, it's good to see everybody in the house today. This is a, a special Sunday for me because I have my uncle Rick Winquist with me this morning. Yeah, he and his wife Shan made the trip down and have spent the weekend with us. And it's special to me because Rick is the one who actually taught me how to play the acoustic guitar. So if I mess up today, it's his fault. <laughs> uh, but Rick has been a worship leader for many years up in Kentucky and it's just an honor to have him here and uh, yeah just to follow his example so we're excited we're ready to worship I see my kids up in the balcony this morning yeah it's good to see you guys so why don't y'all stand and join us as we begin today Trust you alone, trust in you alone. 
Well, I've been turned around, but I've never been lost. Seen the waters get troubled, but we walk across. When my knees were shaking, you held my hand, turning my problems to a promise. Somebody gave me ten years, you brought me through. Seen somebody build mountains, that just up and move. Glory, glory, hallelujah, yeah, that's my song. Walking with my father. You receive it, you can feel it, 
been in the book of Acts week by week uh, as we've kind of walked through uh, the story, uh, the story, the, the scriptures, the verses, line upon line through Acts. Last week we ended up, uh, we finished chapter 15 and went into 16, and I'll say uh, uh, last week's message, this week's message, and next week's message are kind of like part one, part two, part three, so there'll be overlap in some of the scriptures that we're going to read. Uh, last week what we looked at was Paul and Barnabas were going to go out again and go check up on the places that they, the churches that they started and the places they visited on their first journey. But what happened was they had beef, right? Uh, uh, John Mark, uh, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them again. And Paul said, no, he can't go with us because he quit last time when we were on the road. And because that was his nephew, Barnabas was like, come on, give the guy another chance. And Paul said, no. And so they split. Paul took Silas and went one way, and Barnabas and John Mark went a different way. And what we saw was they went on this journey, and they wanted to go desperately, or Paul wanted desperately to go to the cities, the major metropolitan cities of Asia Minor. And we'll see that verse again today. But what happened was, as he kept trying to go to those places, the Holy Spirit just wouldn't prevent him to go. Oh, well, kept preventing him and wouldn't allow him to go. Then he went, kept going, kept going, and he said, okay, well, let's try again. The Holy Spirit just wouldn't allow him to go. And so he went to other places, to Phrygia, went to Galatia, uh, ended up even in Troas. And so what we're going to see is I'm going to go back through some of those passages because even as we discussed last night uh, on Wednesday night during Bible study here, uh, uh, there are some other little nuggets, some points that the Holy Spirit was like, no, we got to talk about this. And so we're going to go back through chapter 16. I'm going to start at verse number 1, and we'll read down to verse number 24. And then there'll be parts that'll connect uh, for next week once we go back to uh, finish up chapter 16 next week. So if you have your Bibles, your smart devices, please turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Uh, Acts chapter 16, we're going to start in verse number 1. And if you need a title for your notes, uh, 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 you, you can write something to the effect of learning to follow. Learning to follow. Is, is the title of what we're going to talk about here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read Acts chapter 16, verse 1, all the way down to 24, and then we're going to kind of talk about it. Um, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, but please feel free to follow along with whatever translation you have in front of you. We'll get to the same place. Amen? So Acts chapter 16, verse number 1, it reads as follows. It says, Paul went first to Derbe and then to Lystra, where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. In deference to the Jews of the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia. This is the part we were talking about, but pay close attention. Because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. 
Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided, so, so we decided to leave from Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Verse 11, we boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Simon, Simon Thrice. And the next day we landed next to Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony, and we stayed there for days. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to, the, to a riverbank where, where, where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. And she listened to us. The Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her house were baptized, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. One day, as we were going down to the place, to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he instantly left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed around Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. And we're going to stop here in verse 24 for today. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet into the stocks. I was like, Pastor, we didn't get to the good part. That's eh, another Sunday. It'll be all right. I want to focus first on what we saw in chapter, uh, in verses number 6 through 10, where we see them uh, wanting to go to this place, but the Holy Spirit telling them not to go, right? I know we talked a little bit about this last week, but I want to start with the first point here up on your screens. As important as it is to realize when the Holy Spirit is preventing you, you know, to go, to realize when the Holy Spirit is preventing you to go somewhere, it is equally important to understand that God has a place for you. See, sometimes we get caught up in the fact that, yeah, but Pastor, this was the perfect opportunity. This was the perfect job. I just knew this was all going to work out for me. This is what I had planned, and the Holy Spirit didn't make it work, and we can become frustrated. We could be so frustrated by the fact that this didn't work out that we don't take a step back and realize God still has a place for us. And here's a tough truth that goes right along with this. The tough truth is this. The Holy Spirit guides us as much by the closing of doors as he does by the opening of doors. And that's all just say amen. <laughs> it doesn't always feel good to have a closed door, Right? Uh, look, uh, can we say amen again? <laughs> it, it doesn't feel good to have a closed door. Uh, we love it when we have a plan and God's like, amen, and it just works right on out. But if we truly understand that God is leading and guiding us, just as with Paul and his companions who are traveling here, those closed doors that they had were still a part of where God was leading them, even if they couldn't see it at the time. So what do we do then, Right? Maybe right now you're, you're in a season or in a place where you're facing some closed doors. You're facing some things that you just knew this was going to work out or this was the plan. And the Holy, you know, you're like, we're going to go right. And the Holy Spirit says, nope, we're going to go left. You're like, we're going to go forward. And the Holy Spirit says, nope, I need you to stay still. So, so what do we do? We do the same thing that we saw Paul and his companions do. What did they do? When you look at what they did, uh, uh, they served faithfully where they found themselves. They served faithfully where God had opened, opened the door for them. Now, you don't get amens on that, but it's the truth. 
You say, I got to stay here with this mean boss and this mean, this, I got to stay here until God opens the door. Yes. And we serve faithfully because what does Colossians 3 tell us? Our work is unto the Lord, not to man. The reason we can do this is um, we have to settle within ourselves a couple things. One, we need to know that while God wants to give each and every one of us a very personal and individual vision for our lives, our vision and our plan is always a part of God's much bigger plan and purpose. And so even though it might not make sense to us now, right, we might not have understanding of like, oh, God, we might not have that understanding. It's all a part of a bigger purpose and a bigger plan that he has. In this case, Paul wanted to bring the gospel to these large cities in Asia Minor, uh, but as God was moving Paul away from Asia Minor, he was leading him towards Rome. Paul was looking north, and God wanted him to look west. Paul could never fully realize in his lifetime how God would eventually use the Roman Empire to spread the gospel to the whole world. And as God uses us for his work, it may not always be easy to see or to understand but with faith, we need to trust that God has a plan for us, that God can see. He knows the end from the beginning, and he's planned accordingly. We have to be able to trust God. Because here's the thing. We say, yeah, Pastor, I trust God until it doesn't go the way I want it to go. Oh, you too? Yes, that's, that's yeah, that's. So if we're going to trust him, we have to trust him fully. And as we look at this passage, when we get down to verse number 9, it doesn't tell us specifically, right? This whole way when they're going to Asia, it didn't tell us specifically how God told Paul not to go to these places. We, we, don't, we don't really see that, right? Uh, I was doing some research. It said that um, for them to go to Troas, it was a, a, about 400-mile walk. And so it said something like if they walked for 12, uh, on average, about 12 hours a day, it would take them 13 days to get all the way to Troas. That's the equivalent of us leaving here in Atlanta and walking to either Cincinnati or maybe Indianapolis by foot. Now, I don't know what that journey was like. I don't know why they didn't just call an Uber. Maybe their sales service wasn't good. Who knows? <laughs> but at the same time, he was very intentional to be able to hear from God along the journey, to be able to hear from that Holy Spirit to say, should I go, should I do this, and, and keep following with that. And we do get a glimpse of something here in verse number 9. Uh, Audrey, put up verse 9 and 10. We'll go back to verse 9 and 10. We get a glimpse of one of the ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to Paul, and this is when he had that vision. So what does it say? It said, that night Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so what did they do? They decided to leave from Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. He is told in a dream, right, that there's a man in Macedonia and as we look at this, oh, man, we got some good nuggets to chew on here. I get excited about this. So, so first, I, I want to ask you a question. And, and this is a real question, but you don't have to answer. Do you believe that God has a purpose and plan for each season of your life? We believe that, right? We, okay, okay. And, and I realize that there, there, there are two answers to the question. Because some people, you know, some people are going to say yes, because they, they, they know this, right? If you say, yes, I know that God has a purpose and plan for each season of my life, then I'll ask you this question, uh, why do we worry so much? As if God's not going to bring his plan to pass. But let's talk on the other side. If you say, Pastor, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think he does. Well, if, if you're not sure, I need you to understand that not only does God know where he's leading you, he also knows where you are currently. He knows where he's taking you, but he knows where you are currently. We posted something, um, I don't know, one day last week uh, on our, the, the, the social media and all that stuff. And it said something to the effect of, um, if you look at your life and look at your story, God didn't do all of the things that he's done in your life to get you here, on, to get you where you are right now, only to get you here, and that's it, right? Like, God didn't do the stuff. You say, man, I can look back at my life, and I can see God was doing this. I can see God protecting me from this. I can see God did these amazing things, and he didn't do that to get you here just to get you here, and that's it. And so if you can be confident that if God got me here, then there is some place that he wants to take me, even if I might find myself right now in a valley even if I find myself maybe in a desert place, even if I find myself right now with some challenges, right? He's leading and he's guiding each and every one of us. Uh, so Wednesday night, 
uh, during Bible study, we were talking about this passage, and, and my good friend Jocelyn right here uh, gave a point. And so, you know, as a pastor, we don't steal. We just borrow. <laughs> but she made this great point during Bible study uh, as we looked at this passage of him seeing this vision of I'm supposed to go to Macedonia. And so I'm going to borrow some of what we talked about Wednesday and ask you this question. Where is your Macedonia? So forget about Paul for a second. (laughs) But think about yourself. Where is your Macedonia? You say, what's my Macedonia? Uh, This is where uh, 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 that place that God has called you to not only go but to also serve. If you recognize, it wasn't just about him getting to Macedonia, but it was something God had for him to do once he got there. And we say amen. (laughs) It's not just about getting to the place, but also serving there. And if you say, well, Pastor, this, this, you know, Love Ridge, this this is my Macedonia. This is where God sent me. Well, first I'm going to say praise God, amen, that's great. But but then i got to ask you a follow-up question, because you know I love a good question, right? Follow-up question is this. Have you asked the Holy Spirit to show you how you can use your gifts and talents in your Macedonia? Because Paul wasn't just supposed to get there and then go get like a funnel cake and, um, I don't know, you know, stop and get some boba tea or whatever it is. You know, he, he didn't just do that, right? He got to this place and got busy. He got to the place and God was using him. And, and when I say that, even though I brought up the church, I want you to think broader than that as well. The different places and the different people you interact with in your life, how can God use you there? It can't just be for us to get there just for us. I believe God wants to use every single one of us in the places where we find ourselves. To to, to my teens, as you're in school or as you're on sport teams, God wants to use you there. With with my adults, you say you say, Pastor, I work with people and they they they, they cuss like sailors and all this good stuff. Or this place is just it's just a wild environment that I work in. It's like yeah, but you know what? If we're called to be light, light has its greatest impact in the midst of darkness, right? Not just around other light. And so maybe there's a reason you're there. So it's not just about, Pastor, where's my Macedonia? But, but Holy Spirit, how can you use my gifts and talents in this place? Because I believe when we get there, God has something for us to do. He has something for us to do. Um, I'll put on my little pastor hat for a second and say this. Uh, the, the other part of it is this. I'm not one of those people who believe that if um, you say, okay, pastor, I, I, I'm praying and asking God, where could I use my gifts and talents here at the church? Uh, if you are a teacher, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to serve with kids here. You know, you said, I, I just made it through the school year without choking 10 of them. So <laughs> maybe that's not where God's called you to serve here at this place because that's what you do as a vocation. So it's important for all of us to not just assume, like, oh, I work with kids, I'm going to work with kids here. No, maybe there's another area for God to serve, for God to use you and and use your gifts and talents here, because God is purposeful. If he brought you here, there's something for you to do. And I'm going to keep going. (laughs) Yeah. um, Here's the advice I would give. Go to the next one. You know what we need to do? Discover and do what God has planned for you to do in each season of your life. That's pretty simple and uncomplicated, isn't it? We got to discover and do. When you say discover, what do you mean discover? Okay, uh, this will be a little cross-reference for you to look up later. Ephesians 2.10, all right? It, it says that we're supposed to walk in these things that God already planned beforehand. He already planned the task for us to do, and he said we're going to walk in them. We're going to go and do the task. So, so then I'm just discovering something that he's already got assigned for me to do. So are you doing the task that you sense God telling you to do? It, it, are, are there things that you say you, you kind of dismiss, but it keeps coming up? Holy Spirit keeps kind of just nudging you like, you should do this. You should be a part of this. You should help with this. Again, don't just think here because I believe our impact is not just here. It's beyond these four walls as well. It could be in your neighborhood. You could be sitting here, and, and I'll kind of talk about this point again later, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you could be in a neighborhood, and you could be frustrated with how... Um, uh, the, what is it, the HOA is going, or, or certain things are happening in your community. You're like, oh, I'm so frustrated. I wish they would do this. You know what I found? Sometimes the reason it bothers you is because you're supposed to be used to be a part of the solution. There's been times we're sitting and say, is, does anybody not care about this? And it's like, oh, he's tugging at your heart. 
He is doing something here because he needs you to be his hands and feet out there. Don't ignore those moments and those opportunities um, to be uh, used. We should ask God to show us uh, uh, where we can serve and then just go for it. Um, (laughs) There's another part when you look at this idea of him getting this vision to go to Macedonia. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, So so one of the things I always talk about is I said I, I often believe that God will let you believe what you need to believe to get you where he needs you to go right? Uh, I think the example I used to use was with my, this lady here that I'm married to. Uh, when she moved to Atlanta to go to grad school, she told people, oh, yeah, I'm just going to be here two years and then I'm going back to Virginia, right? And I, and I always joked like the angels were like, two years? What? And God's like, shh, don't, just let her go, just let her go. Well, in this case, did you notice he had a vision of a man in Macedonia he was supposed to meet with, but when he got there, he met with two ladies. There was no man. There was Lydia and the enslaved woman that he met with. Think about that. He said, hey, we're going to go meet with this guy. This guy is blagging and pleading with us, but that's not who we we met when we get there. And I say that to say we have to be okay with uh, if God tells us to go and we get there and we realize there's a different plan, it's okay. As long as we're still being led, as long as he's still guiding us and using us, it's okay. Because what what I've learned is sometimes uh, getting off our plan uh, helps us to be able to get in line with his plan. When we see Paul have this vision, uh, he has this compelling vision of this man begging for help, right? He's begging for help there in verse number nine. And so Paul had to respond to this man's need. There was something about this vision that he's like, I got to go and help this person. And similarly, God can give us a vision to give us a heart uh, that's for people who are maybe broken, right, who are hurting or whatever, that there there's could be a need around us and, and God can do the same thing for us. And so here's kind of the, the question when it comes to that. When we sense a heart towards a problem, do we act or respond similar to how Paul did? He started to have this thing. He's like, man, I see, I see this, this, this guy. They need the gospel and I have to go. And so this goes back to that neighborhood thing. Do, do you have a heart for something and we just keep talking about it versus taking action? My favorite example is my wife. I, I use her a lot because she can just hit me later. But then she's way over there, so I got witnesses in case she throws something, you know. <laughs> but what I think about is they're, they're, with her as an educator, there are certain things that if we see a story on the news or hear about kids not being educated, like, for me, I'm like, oh, man, that's messed up. I sympathize. No, it bothers her. You know, I'll, we watch the story on the news, and I'm like, oh, man, that's messed up. Hey, so we're going to go to Chipotle, or what are we going to do for dinner or whatever, right? But, but an hour later, she's still like, I can't believe they don't do this because it stirs her passion. It, it is a part of what she's called to do, and it's like I can't let it go. It, it, it bothers her. Similarly, we went to, uh, <laughs> we went to a thing recently um, and I was so agitated by how these people were just, um, I'm trying to say because I realize this to be on the internet, <laughs> how they were, in my opinion, just deceiving folks from the gospel. And it just, it, it, it bothered me. I couldn't stop talking about it. Now I'm just over there agitated and mad. And I realized because it stirred my passion. It stirred the thing that I was called to do. And when I see that, I just, oh, I just get like, we have to do something about this. And I say that to ask you this question, is there a problem, uh, 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 is there a people problem or issue that God has put on your heart that stirs your passions? That you feel called to go and serve, that you feel called to be a part of, that you feel called to be used by God, to be his hands and feet, to be an advocate or to work in that situation. And you might say, Pastor, what's up with all these service questions? Well, hold on, you got to understand that uh, uh, if we're someone who follows Christ, if no one else is impacted by the fact that we know Jesus, I think we're not doing something right. And so it's not just for us. I mean, it's for us, <laughs> but it has to go beyond us, right? It has to go, go deeper than that. And so as I look at this, as you see, as we've gone through this journey in the book of Acts, there's this burden that I see here when I look at Paul. See this, and he's like, we got to go. Again, he walked 400 miles seemingly in the wrong direction. I don't even like going to the wrong store when they don't have what I need, right? 
Sorry, jokes. There, there's purpose behind it. They get, they've, they've gotten stoned before. They've gotten beat. They've gotten, gone through all these things, and they still pursue it with a passion. And I think we have to have that same fire and passion about the things that God has called us to do. So maybe what you're supposed to do isn't the same as me, but you need to locate and find that thing for you and go do it. Find those people you're supposed to help and go help. Find those you're supposed to serve and go serve. I want to go back to, um, I want to go to Acts chapter 16 again. We're going to read uh, 13 through 24. And really, I have, I have just kind of one point because I'm going to really talk more about this Wednesday and next Sunday. But I'm going to read the rest of the story that we added in today, um, and then we'll, um, we'll go on. So Acts, back to Acts 16, uh, verse 30, 13 again. I'm going to read this down to the end where Paul gets there. So this is verse 13. There it is. Uh, on Sabbath. It's 13. You got me? <laughs> go 16, 13. I'll go back to 13. And then I'll read down to 24. There it is. All right. It says, on the Sabbath, uh, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought we would, excuse me, where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia of, and I always mess that up, so I'm going to keep going, uh, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And and she urged us until we agreed. One thing about her, she was wealthy. She was a person of means, right? She was an influential businesswoman in this area here. This is who this lady was, right? And she gets saved, and it's a huge deal. But wait, the story goes on. Look at verse 16. So then um, when it gets to 16. He says, uh, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had, this, who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This just went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her, and it instantly left her. Her master's hopes and wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas, Dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They were teaching customs that were legal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in an inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. We're going to talk about the whole jail thing next week, like in great detail, I promise. But, but here's something I just want to highlight from what we just looked at. Two women, completely, you can argue, opposite positions in life, right? One very influential, uh, a person of means. The other one enslaved. She's, she's unnamed. We don't even know her name, right? She's unnamed. But what we see is Paul's used to cast a demon out of her. He shares the, the, the gospel with Lydia. And she becomes very important there. And my final point today with highlighting these women, as I know we'll dive into it more on Wednesday, is this. God is able, he, 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 he's seeing us, helping us, and he's loving us, right? His seeing us, helping us, and loving us is not based on our status in society. The fact that he can see us, help us and love us. It's not based on what we have. It's not based on what we do. It's based on his love for us. And you might say, Pastor, what's, what's, what's the big deal? I think the big deal is if only he helped Lydia, we might say, man, I got to have means to be able to have God to come and help me. All right? Or maybe, maybe God doesn't see me. Or, or, or the, the fact that God was able to reach out and to impact both of them reminds us that no matter where we find ourselves or what our status is, that there's a God who not only really sees us, but has a plan for us and wants to connect with us and wants to use us. The hard part is that we don't know more about what happens to the lady, right? The the, the enslaved person. We don't know what more happens to her, right? 
we have some knowledge about what happened to Lydia and, and, and other cross-references because of what happens in the city there. But I say that to simply say to us that as you go through this journey called life, as you're following God and allowing him to lead you, to, 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 to help you with the things that are on your plate and what you're facing, what I hope you recognize is you have a God who is not just, um, what would I say, like some cosmic mystical out there, but someone who's here that wants to walk with you, that loves you, that has a plan for you, that as you find yourself in the midst of, of challenges or difficulties or even just saying, God, I don't know what to do next. I need answers. I need direction. He wants to be that intimately involved in our lives. He wants to help us and guide us to do what? Not only find our Macedonia, right? Not only find how we can use our gifts and talents, but in each season as the road unfolds ahead, we have this God who wants to lead us in the same way he led them. Hopefully it doesn't take us 400 miles of just walking, right? <laughs> but even if it does, what we see is purpose in everything that they went through. And I believe the same thing with us. There might be things that we experience that aren't great, obviously, right? Jesus said in John 16, in this life you'll have trouble. But what I pray is that as we go forward, we learn to trust him more. We learn to ask for help and guidance, right? But we also go, do, use our gifts. Don't let fear, doubt, or anything else win and keep you from doing the very thing that you sense God telling you to do. Amen? If you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, uh, now is an opportunity for you to do that here in a few moments. But I'd like to explain what we mean when we say that. So what we believe here is that Jesus really did live and walk this earth, right? He died on the cross for our sins, to pay the sin penalty. He was buried for three days. He rose again. As we saw at the beginning of Acts in chapter 1 and chapter 2, he was around for 40 days after he rose from the grave, and they saw him, and they spent time with him. Set up to like 500 of his disciples saw him. And then he went to heaven and said that I'll return. And so what we have to do is, Believe in that death, that burial, and resurrection. That's what gives us access to heaven once we die. Because what we know, every single one of us is going to die one day. Uh, this, this is one of those facts that we can't get around. But the good news is he's already made a provision for us. That believing in that death, burial, and resurrection is what gives us access to go to heaven when we die. Each of us has to make that decision for ourselves. And so if you can't say with, with a surety that, man, uh, if I were to die here in the next few moments, I know I would be in heaven, it is time for you to get saved. When I ask this question, it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's not about anything, any of those things. It's about really having a relationship with the one who created you and knows you better than you know yourself. By making that decision and securing your future, there's two parts to that, right? One is your future is secured that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. But the other thing we realize is, it's not like, okay, now that I'm saved, I have, like, life insurance and I can go sit down. There's tasks and assignments for us to do while we're yet living, just as we see with Paul and we've seen with Peter and all of them in the book of Acts so far. And so you recognize that there is something for you to do in your life to be able to impact other people, but you can't do it on your own. You have to do it by being connected to him. And so in a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing. There will be a prayer counselor standing down here. If you need to get saved, please, ma'am, please, sir, make that decision today to become a follower of Christ. It's an amazing journey full of highs and lows, but it is worth it. Second is this idea of rededication. So rededication is for those who say, well, Pastor Jason, I, I've, I've made that decision to place my faith in Jesus, but if I'm honest, maybe I'm not living the life that I should be living. Maybe there's been loss, hurt, trauma, uh, uh, bad decisions, right? Uh, drugs or, or, or sex or whatever it is. There might be things you say, man, I, I just, I feel like I need to get myself together, uh, then I can come back to God. Or, or sometimes we find ourselves walking in guilt and condemnation where we say, well, I can't even pray because I've done these things. And often what happens is we get to a place where maybe we feel like God doesn't love us. And it's a lie. God loves you with a never failing, undying love. And you know what he tells us to do? He says, repent. Turn from the thing and turn back to me. 
I often use an analogy when you're driving a car. Uh, usually when I drive with the GPS, and the GPS will say, hey, go forward for two miles. And because I'm driving the car, I can choose to go in a different direction. I can ignore the instructions. I can go my own way. And what I've learned is the GPS never yells at me. Instead, it locates where I am currently and charts a course to get me to where I need to go. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit does with us. Do we have to deal with the sin and consequences of our actions? Of course, that's just how it works. But the good news is that there is a way forward. And so if, if that is you that I am speaking to in a moment when the prayer counselors come, please, I, 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 ask, you, I ask you to come down. Uh, and we can lead you in a prayer of, of rededication to rededicate, recommit yourself to the things of God so you don't have to live your life stuck. I don't believe Jesus died for us to live a life stuck and defeated and feeling like we can't do the things that God has called us to do. Third is prayer. If you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too small, there's nothing too large. We count it a privilege to pray with you, pray for you, uh, and to add our prayers of faith together. So if you need prayer, please come and let us allow us the privilege of being able to pray with you and for you. And last, and certainly not least, if God's called you to be a part of this church, here's what you need to know. One of the things we strive to do here is to teach the Word of God in a simple and an uncomplicated way so you can understand it and go live it. Uh, second, we get busy in our community because we believe that's what the Bible teaches us we have to do. Third, we're a church made up of people from different backgrounds, uh, uh, different walks of life. And what we realize is that God has brought us here together, kind of like what we talked about today, to use our gifts and talents here at this place, but it has to go beyond these four walls to make a difference. And so if you're like, man, I'd love to be a part of that, we would love to have you. So four things. If you need to get saved, if you need to rededicate, if you need prayer, or if God's called you to be a part of this church, uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, if, you, if you can stand right where you are for a moment, can you just stand right where you are? I'm going to ask my prayer counselors to come down and get in position. And then here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to uh, sing with these fine folks behind me. And as we are singing, if you need to respond to one of those four things, please come down and talk to one of our prayer counselors. Amen. If he came today, if you saw the miracles he performed along the way, would you have faith to stand tall, knowing our Lord's love and grace will conquer all? Would you believe? He chose 12 men to follow him. They saw the power of prayer and how it conquered sin. Yet they still feel when seas were rough. Oh, we of little faith, when will you see enough? If he came today, if you saw the miracles he performed along the way, would you have faith to stand tall, knowing our Lord's love and grace will conquer all? Would you? Oh, 